We're talking about prepare the table, but when I think about prepare the table, and when I think about our phrase for this year that we've talked about, about fling wide the doors, it's cool, like we, we had that phrase, fling wide the doors, even before it was like, yeah, let's prepare the table. It, it's, everything's just connecting, like, which is cool when God does that. But fling wide the doors, right? And like that Isaiah 2.2, the, the, the house of the Lord will be chief of the mountains, and the nations will flow to it. And many will say, let us go to the house of the Lord that we may walk in his ways, right? And that he may teach us his word. And like, it's amazing. But when I think on that, sometimes I feel like we could miss a huge component, maybe even half of the, the full picture. Don't get me wrong, preparing a place and something like Vision Builders is so important, right? So there's actually a place. It's like, where does you, where's your church? Oh, we don't really have a place. It's kind of like, you'll just have to find it. Like, it's great to have a place. It's great to have car parks. It's great to have a coffee shop. It's great to have a microphone so people can hear you. Like, it's great to prepare a place. It's great to have teams that are prepared. And we have the best team, am I right? Amazing welcome teams with Sia leading the way and welcoming people in and connecting people in and, and great, like, just people that make all of this happen. It's so important because... Uh, Ryan and uh, Ryan Gilbank and I, uh, Ryan and Jenny aren't here. They're actually up at uh, Noosa, not on the beach. They're up at Noosa helping uh, C3 Noosa celebrate their 10th year, their anniversary of their 10th year, which is us. We're turning 10 this year, church, in August 10. So we're starting to, it's gonna be powerful. I really feel like that's gonna be the like cusp of something else. <laughs> Maybe a bit more powerful sound than... But um, that's all that I had. But yeah, Ryan and I go for rides every now and then with a whole bunch of other people. It's great. And we went to this cafe once and um, we, we were riding along and it's like you only ride for the coffee and the possible donut or almond croissant three quarters of the way through. That's the only reason we exercise. And so we're out riding and, um, and we, we stopped at this coffee shop and we walk in, we you know, put the bikes up and uh, we walk in and... Uh, we, we sort of go up to the counter and it was like the staff, like deer in the headlights, like they'd never seen a customer before. Like, oh, and we're like, hey, we're like, oh, um, are you, are you, do you want a table? Or like, that would be, that would be nice. I see you have heaps around. Like there was literally no one else in this cafe, which should have been a sign, right? Should have been a sign. But anyway, it's like, uh, yeah, that would be great. It's like, oh, okay, um, well, you, we can't split the bill for you. Like, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to just all pay an equal portion. We can't itemize it. And we're like, all right, it's all good. We can work it out, just a seat. And then we got a bit of sass and, you know, all of that. It was just like, okay, we sat down and we enjoyed it. So it was like, they were just so unprepared. It was like, they were not ready for people. And I don't, we don't want a church where people come in and it's like, oh, um, yeah, maybe this way, or I don't really know. And oh, like coming with all the, you can't do this and you can't do, it's just like, we wanna be prepared for people. We wanna have a place. Preparation is so important. So we will train teams and we will have systems in place and we will do all that. But it's half the story. A pl a preparing a place and preparing a people and, and systems and structures and all that, our own, uh, that we do all that and we have great programs and great ministries. Why? So people could fill it. We built this and we have this room so people could fill it, right? It's it's, it's both end. We can't say, yeah, just fling wide the doors and we just stand at the door. It's like, mm, they might come. I don't, I don't know, right? Like, it's like, no, we're, we're the ones that actually go and bring people and fill it. We bring people in and we fill this place. And I, I do see this place filled. Like, there's, there's a few, you look around you, there's a few empty seats here this morning, right? I see this place filled. I see this place filled many times over I see this place filled with young people, with kids. On Sundays, I see this place filled with kids during the week with different programs and mums and all that in the community coming in and parents coming in. I see, this place, I see this place filled with youth on a Friday night, right? Kids encountering Jesus and worshiping Him. I see this place, this place filled with young adults doing the same thing. I see, I see families coming into this place. I see our 50 pluses coming into this place and services for them. Come on, I see every generation filling this place. People encountering Jesus, receiving salvation, being healed, being set free, being made whole. I see this place being filled. I do, it will happen. This place will be filled. And I love Pastor Phil. Lift, lift up your eyes. Pastor Phil, a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know what, I, I think 
uh, what was he saying? He was like, yeah, at this church, where we're at right now, it's like, well, this, this could actually be a church of a 1,000 people. This could be a church of a 1,000. We might need a bit bigger building or we might need 10 services, either way, right? But it's like, whoa, it's a different perspective. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm sitting here, right? And I'm filling this place, but it's this place should be filled many times over, right? Many times over, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But I just wanna celebrate We talked about this with the team earlier on, but in 2021, we saw six first-time decisions and three recommitments, which is awesome. Uh, The following year, in 2022, we saw 10 first-time decisions and five recommitments, which is awesome. Um, But already this year, we've seen six first-time decisions and seven recommitments. Already, come on, give God praise for that. That's amazing. It's better than 2021 and it's on track to smash 2022. And why? Why is that awesome? Because we wanna see this place filled with people encountering Jesus and finding purpose and finding community and relationship. And I just tell you, Haggai 2.9 says, the latter days of this house will be greater than the former. That is a word that we've had on our heart all year for this church. And this place will be filled. And uh, I've got... 10 minutes to share the rest of it. So how do, we, how do we go about filling this place? How do we do that? How do we go about filling this place, seeing this place filled? I wanna, I wanna look at a parable in Luke 14. If you've got your Bibles or your, uh, your Bible app, why don't you open up, follow along. Luke 14, we're, gonna, we're just gonna read 16 to 23. And we're just gonna break it down very quickly. It says, I love this passage. So it starts with this, it says, um, but Jesus, so Jesus is with um, some Pharisees, some lawyers, all those people. He's been invited to their house. He's sitting there uh, and he starts addressing different people there. And so he addresses the Pharisees first, then he addresses, and what, which is what this is, he addresses the host of this dinner and he also addresses the guests at this dinner. And so Jesus says this to the person hosting. He says, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. Say many. I want us to get this in our heart. Many. Many. He invited many. This is clearly an analogy of God and the kingdom of God and people being invited into the kingdom of God. And it says he throws a great banquet and he invites many. I love this. You know, Charles Spurgeon, I don't know if you've heard of Charles Spurgeon, great theologian and um, he was actually uh, a Calvinist, right? And some people don't really like Calvinists uh, because of some of their beliefs. And you've got like, um, you know, predestination and election and all of that. And there's, people are still warring about it. But even Spurgeon, a Calvinist, he says these amazing words. He says, those individuals who try and caricature our doctrinal sentiments, very heady, are in the habit of saying that we teach that God has only chosen a few to be saved and he's left the great majority of mankind to perish. We've said no such thing. On the contrary, we believe that God has ordained a countless host, so numerous that no man can number it, who shall be saved. And we think that we have some warrant for believing that the number of the saved will vastly exceed the number of the lost, that in all things Christ would have preeminence. The chosen people of God are not a mere handful. Come on. And we believe that when the time comes for the great king to take up his jewels, it shall be found that the casket contains such multitudes of them that they shall be beyond all human calculation. It is our joy to know that God has chosen a great host to be saved. Say many. Come on, we gotta have a many type posture in our heart. My, let's, not put our, let's not have limited thinking for a second. Let's not put ourselves in the place of God and try and figure out in our heads, would that person, would, you know, would they, would they want this? Does God want that? Like, my Bible says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, say whoever, whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. We've got to have a whoever, a many posture in our heart right, that that person that we're working with right now, God's invited them along. My tyrannical boss, I don't have one, but maybe yours, like, yes, he's not, she's invited too. Yeah, that person wasting their life away right now, it's all going down the toilet, yes, they're invited too. That person that is, looks like they're vehemently against God, yes, 
they're invited to, whoever. Every single person that you walk past in a day, that you interact with a day, that is a whoever. That is somebody that, could, that has been invited to this great banquet. It's not limited. God has set a vast banquet and he has invited many to come. That's good news, amen. My wife sometimes asks me, she says, um, hey babe, this week, well, what do you want for dinner? Like what, like, you know, what are some dinner options that, you know, I'm gonna go do the shopping tomorrow. You know, I'm gonna do the shopping. Like what sort of some meal options or like, hey, what do you want for dinner tonight? And I, I, I'm really helpful and I say, whatever. <laughs> I'm happy with anything. And she loves that. <laughs> no, it doesn't, because what is she looking for? She's looking for me to narrow it down, right? Narrow down the options, to help me out a little here, right? Because it can't be just anything, right? But the opposite is true with God. There is no narrowing down of people. It is vast, it is whoever may believe. Come to him, come to the banquet, I love it. So verse 17, it says, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. So really this is a picture of Jesus and uh, the kingdom of God coming with Jesus and his ministry. That's what this is talking about, right? Um, but, and those that have been invited, they're the, they're the people of God, they're the, the Jewish people, right? God's chosen people. Um, so um, yeah, invite, say to come for everything is now ready. I think there's a great application here though because the reality is is that you and I are now that servant as well that says come, come, the banquet's ready, come. That's actually you and I. 2 Corinthians 5.18, oh my gosh, it says all of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, you're like, oh, I don't really know what my purpose is in life. You know, we all go through that. I, I can tell you, without even talking to you and getting to know you, I know the first thing you've been given from Jesus, the ministry of reconciliation. You're a minister, right? You don't have to wear a collar. You don't have to, you, as a believer, are a minister. Of what? Of reconciliation. Of reconciling people to God. That is Christ. Uh, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not holding their sins against them. I love that. And he entrusts to us the message of reconciliation, the ministry and the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Do you, do you know you're an ambassador for Christ? Right now, in your workplace, in your family, as you go about your day today, you are an ambassador for Christ. God is actually making his appeal through us so we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, come to God. For our sake, he, was made, he made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to become sin, so that in him we might be, become the righteousness of God. That is the gospel. That is so, so amazing. We're the ones who say, come, right? That's you and I. See, the thing is, the invitation had, I don't know if you picked this up, but the invitation had already been sent. Right, so it says, hey, go to the people that had been invited and say, come. So the servant wasn't inviting people. That's not his job. He didn't come up with the guest list. The master did. So too, God has come up with the guest list, those that would be invited to come into relationship with him. The servant's job is just to go, hey, come. Come, come along, that's you and I. So we don't have to be like, oh, are they on the guest list or not? Like, we are just the ones that say, come. Come, be reconciled to God. That's what you and I do. Because salvation, it's not an act uh, or a work of man. It's not, it's not a work of the flesh or the intellect. It's the Spirit of God. Flesh and blood doesn't reveal this to you, right, Jesus said. But the Spirit of God, the invitation has already been sent to people. We are just the ones that say, come. Ecclesiastes 3, didn't Hamish do a great job? He read from Ecclesiastes this morning. It's a great book. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has put eternity into the heart of man. That's why people walk around with this like, mm, there has to be something more, there has to be meaning to life, there, there's a good, there's an evil, there has to be something after this. What? That's why people are on this search, because God has put eternity in their heart. C.S. Lewis says, if I find within myself desires that nothing in this world can satisfy, it only stands to reason that I was made for another world than this. 
every person has been made for another world than the current one that we live in. God has put eternity into their heart. The invitation has already been sent to them. And we just simply say, come. We say, as it says in 2 Corinthians, now is the favorable time. Behold, now the day, today is the day of salvation. Today's the day. I love this story um, from a guy named Jack Deere. He's a pastor in the, um, in the States. He's got a great book about the spiritual gifts and all of that. It's amazing. Um, so he's on this plane flight for a couple of hours and he's sat next to this young girl and he starts talking with her and finds out that she's not, um, not a believer at all. And so he gets talking to her and he decides, I'm gonna witness to her. I'm gonna, I'm gonna witness to her, I'm gonna talk with her. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna get her, you know? And then he starts talking with her, starts talking with her, and she's, just, she's re actually reading this book that he's read. It's like a psychology book, and he's like, oh, this is awesome. I'm gonna be able to debunk everything and stuff. And so they end up having this debate, like on the, not like a, a big one, but just between them on the plane, this debate back and forward, and she just, she just constantly was disputing everything he said and was like, I just can't understand your explanation of the gospel and just couldn't get it. And he's like, man, I've, I've failed. Like, I've had those moments too, like, oh, okay. <laughs> didn't work, didn't go as I thought it would go. Um, and they're starting to descend, but then the, the pilot says, hey, there's a snowstorm beneath us. We need to circle around for 45 or so minutes more. And so Jack just goes, okay, God, speak to me and speak to her. And two sentences come to his mind, which I would never suggest anyone say or think to say myself, right? He says this, he says, your problem is the same as mine. You're a sinner and you need a savior. And she burst into tears and said, it's true, it's true. I know, I know. He's tried that line many times after and he says it's never worked again. <laughs> Walk with the spirit, people, right? Don't create a system and a method out of that. Just keep walking with the spirit. He'll give you the words to say in the moment, the Bible says. But how amazing is that? The invitation is already sent. She knew in her heart, I need a savior. And he, he just said, today's the day. You're a sinner, you need a savior, just like me, come. And she did, she received Jesus on that flight, right then and there. How amazing is that? We're just the ones, that's you and I. We can have those moments where we just, we just, we just take some boldness, right? But where we just, we're the ones that just say, come. We're just the ones that say, hey, come, now's the time. For time, we won't look into verse 18 and 20, but basically everyone just comes up with excuses. Right? They say, I can't come because I've bought this and I'm married and I've got, bought, just bought five oxen, all of that. Um, not, cut, not, you know, we don't really have that these days. But people, they're basically, there's all these excuses. People rejecting Jesus, rejecting the gospel, right? And just as in that day there were people that rejected Jesus, there will still be people today that will reject Jesus, that will reject the, the simple invitation of, hey, come to Jesus and be reconciled to him. Again, that's not on me, that's not my problem right? You know, it's at work. You're like, when something's happening at work, you're like, not my problem. <laughs> you know, you can just kind of distance yourself from it. It's like, that's, that's not my problem. All I, I, that, and that shouldn't dishearten me from continuing to go on and say, hey, come, come. But there will be people that are just not ready for it. I've, I've sat with somebody for three hours, a stranger, who just three hours around a table having a couple of coffees. Three hours I talked with this guy about Jesus and what he thought and we just, and nothing happened. And nothing happened at all. And all I could do at the end was just find the church or in his area, connect him with it and just pray with him. And, and that was it, right? Some people, it's just like they're just not ready for it, right? Because it's not intellect. It's not, you don't wrestle somebody into submission, like into it. Like it's not flesh. It's the spirit of God that has to do it. And you know what? The, the Bible says that blessed are the poor in spirit because they will inherit the kingdom of heaven not the middle class in spirit, not the person that says, oh, I'm not that bad. Like, I might need a little bit of help, but I do a lot of good, and I try not to do that, and I try not to do that, right? That's middle class in spirit, right? But God, you could, he's a good teacher, he's got a few good principles that could help me. That person, it's, it, they cannot accept salvation. They cannot uh, inherit the kingdom of God. It's the poor in spirit, the person that says, "With oh God, I've got nothing. I need a savior. Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Lord, be my Lord. Like that's that type of person, they inherit the kingdom of God. And some people just aren't there yet, and that's okay. Verse 21, it says, the servant reported these things to the master, 
And the master became angry and he said, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes to the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And the servant said, I've done it and there's still room. And the master said, go out again to the highways and the hedges even further and compel the people to come that my house may be filled. How good and gracious is God? Like, how does God respond to rejection in this moment? Anger, see like, ooh, <laughs> anger, but not anger that shuts people out and gives people a silent treatment, and anger that actually gives way to greater benevolence and greater blessing. How good is God? And now again, this literally is representing us. When it says go out to the highways and the hedges, right? That's actually us, that's people that aren't God's people, aren't the, you know, the Jewish people. That's us, the outsider, right? The highways and the hedges, the outsider, bring them in, invite them in. That's good news. We've been invited into that. But he says go two times. And he says, first time he says go and bring them, which means like lead them. And then the second time he says go and compel them. That word like meaning to kind of force, like force them to come, like be compelling, right? Do you know what the, the Great Commission isn't go into all the world and be a Christian? The Great Commission is go into all the world and make disciples. The, it just got quiet in here. It's not go into all the world and be a Christian. It's go into all the world and reconcile people to Christ. It's go into all the world and lead people to Jesus. It's go into all the world and compel people to come. It's go into all the world, like 2 Corinthians was saying, and reconcile with the ministry and the message of reconciliation. And so practically this morning, I just wanna talk about how do we do this? And you're gonna love this, you're gonna love this. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about a few ways that we can prepare and things that we can do for this, right? We can prepare um, in prayer. We should be praying, right? And we pray as a church all during the week and on Sundays for people and family and friends every day, right? You, we've got some cards out there in the hub that you can fill out names of people and you can just put it in your wallet like I do or have it on your fridge or something like that. And it just reminds you like, oh yeah, I'm gonna pray for so-and-so. I'm gonna pray for so-and-so. Let's be praying. Pray for them. Pray for their salvation. Pray that God would ready their heart. Pray that God would use you, that He would give you words, that He'd give you boldness. Prayer is important. Say prayer. Second one is heart. Let's prepare our heart, right? Because if someone, if this place does start to you know, fill up or someone does wanna like come to Jesus that you know and you lead them to Jesus, it's like I've gotta have space in my heart for them to walk with them, to give them time, right? Because they're not just gonna be perfect. It doesn't work like that. It's gonna be a little bit messy and I've gotta be okay with that, right? Or someone sitting in the seat I sit in every week. Make some room in your heart, you know? Prepare our heart. Third one, prepare your story. Right? I, I think we should all have like a 30 second and like a three minute version. We did this the other week with our youth, some of our two incredible youth um, the other week. And we talked about, let's prepare our story. Like, so, okay, what was life like before Jesus? What was it like receiving Jesus? And what is life like now after Jesus? Now that he's in your life, you can share that with the hair. I normally, it's normally hairdressers or like, you know, that sort of, you know, someone that you've got a bit of, you know, it might be your coworker. You know, it could be a family member or a friend. When the opportunity comes, be ready with your story. Um, but the fourth is awesome. It's super practical. There's so many ways. Like, you could, you could street preach today, for sure. I, I actually heard, it still works. I, I heard of a, someone just the other week in our church saying that a young kid actually heard a street preacher the other day. Uh, and now they wanna know more about Jesus and wanna know more about church. We gave them details for youth and things like that because they heard a street preacher, right? So even that person shouting on the corner, that, that can work, right? But something super practical that I think we can all do and it is so natural is this fourth thing that we can do and that is prepare your table. It's hospitality. And this is, hospitality is so central, it's so biblical. It's so central to Jesus's ministry. It's so central to the gospel. It's so central to the early church. You see lots of people eating, who loves to eat, right? And maybe in your family, it's like, you know, like it's like we, we get together all the time, we eat, and maybe you don't have that, right? But in the Bible, what we see, and in the early church, what we see is so much getting together. Jesus is literally at this moment, he's sitting with Pharisees and lawyers. They've invited him over for dinner, and he's having dinner with them. 
Jesus had meals and he spent time with his enemies. He had meals and spent time with the elite and with the poor and the prostitute and the tax collector, right? He was the friend of sinners, people said about him. So he was, there was, there's so much food, it's so good. But Jesus was always sitting with people, not just people. That's important. Tim Keller says this, he says, people get loved to believe, not argued to believe. People get loved to believe. And where's one of the best places that you can love on somebody? It's around a meal. It's spending some time together. So what is hospitality? Gospel hospitality is welcoming people into your life. At its base, basic point, it's welcoming people into your life. And, and a great way of doing that is welcoming people at home. That's, that's gospel hospitality, is welcoming somebody into your life, right, into your home. Your home, your home is so special. You might think it's small and it's not as big as this one and I wish I had more room and I wish I could do this with it. But it's, but it's the place. At the end of the day, you go home to and you get rejuvenated you get nourished and you protected and sheltered and you know there's it's things the way you like them right that's and you know what the power is because you bring someone else into that to experience that and they get to experience that shelter that rejuvenation that refreshment that you feel and so your house is so important so welcome people into your life and number two treat strangers as family you know the greek word for hospitality in the bible is philozania. Have you heard of xenophobia, right? Fear of the strange and the foreign. This is the exact opposite. It's the love of the strange. It's the love of the stranger. That is the word the Bible uses for hospitality. I mean, the hospitality, I was in the hospitality, you know, business for quite a while, coffee shops, McDonald's, shout out, right? That, you know, we, we have a, a, a thought about what hospitality is. Oh, it's just food or it's, you know, service. It's actually the love of the stranger. How powerful is that? So there's three groups of people I believe that I think we should show hospitality to. Number one, other Christians. Okay, number one. You're like, well, Christians aren't very strange. Well, if you, <laughs> have you, you ever met many? There's some strange Christians. Or strange in the way of they don't believe what you, they don't think the way that you think. Their life isn't exactly like your life, right? There is a strange foreign element to it. And that's what the beautiful thing is about the body of Christ is it's the members being knit together with Christ as the head. So showing hospitality, right? Having people over, going out, barbecue, you know, going to the park, doing something, spending time together, yes, with other Christians. And that's actually, Jesus said, this is how people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. So actually our love for one another in this community actually is one of the best pictures to the outside world that we are who we say we are. So that's number one, other Christians. Number two, your neighbour. Who's your neighbour? What's the person, yeah, literally maybe lives right next to you, the person you work with, the person in your team at work, the person that you go to that gym session with, right, that class with, that's your neighbour. Show love and hospitality to them because they probably don't share your belief, right, either. So it's showing hospitality to them. It's getting a meal with them. It's having them over. Um, and number three, needy people, the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, people that would never be able to, never be able to return the favour. It's loving and blessing them as well, as Jesus says. And if you feel challenged, awesome, because I have some friends now. <laughs> it's challenging. But this is, imagine if we all in this place, over the next month, over the month of May, you had you showed hospitality to like one of those groups of people this, this month. Like if everyone in our church did that, could you imagine what would happen? If you had that, you know, Steve from work over and his family, or you went to the park with that, with that other mom, or whatever it is, if you showed hospitality, if you had that person that you met that's doing it tough, imagine if we all did that, what would happen? Showed hospitality to that person. Hebrews 13, two says, um, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Oh my goodness. So go and bring, go and compel. My question is, who, who are you bringing right now? Who are you compelling right now? When we think about church, and oh, I've got church on Sunday, or I've got this, who are you bringing? Who are you compelling? Who are we reaching out to right now? And you know what? Inviting them to a Sunday service might not be the first step at all. As I said, it's a table. It's, it's inviting them into your home. It's, it's getting around them. It's inviting them into your life. These are great steps. 
And uh, imagine if next week everyone brought one, one person. Imagine that. We might have a little bit of a problem on our hand, but that's okay. Our team can sort it out. It's Mother's Day next week. It's free coffee. There's free treats after the service. If they're a mum, they get a gift. That's pretty great. There's fun, there's celebrations. We've got, actually got Eva preaching next week and Jenny Gilbank preaching next week into our series. That's an easy sell, easy thing to bring someone along to, to compel someone to come along to. There's scones, you don't even need to compel them. They're like, I'm there. Is there whipped cream? I'm there. I would be there. So I'll just finish on this. Um, Verse 21 to 23, just going back, it says, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes, bring them in. I've done that, there's still room. Okay, go to the highways and the hedges and compel them in that my house may be filled. I love this heart that we see, the heart of God, and this is the heart that we should carry in this church, that there's still room, there's still room. And that our house may be filled, that this house may be filled, that the house of the Lord may be filled again and again. Here's the thing, when he came, there was no room for him, right? There's no room for him at the inn, Christmas story, right? No room for him at the inn. There was no room in people's hearts for him, yet he made room for us at the table in the Father's house. He says, in my Father's house, there are many rooms and I go to prepare a place for you. For everyone, for who? Anyone, whoever would believe in Him. There is room in the Father's house and there is room in our church. This is the heart that we need to carry. There's still room. There's still room for your friends and your family in this place. And you know what? When this place fills up, if everyone brought someone next week and it's too full, and we've actually had some huge services this year where it's been like, oh, we're at capacity, right? When this service fills up, we add another. Why? Because there's still room. And when that one fills up, what do you do? you add another service because there's still room that our Father's house may be filled. God's desire is that His church would be filled, that this church would be filled. People's lives transformed, people being saved and healed and set free, delivered, that His house would be filled. So let's fill it. Let's fill it. Let's go and bring. Let's go and compel. Let's prepare in prayer. Let's prepare our heart. Let's prepare our story. And why don't we think about preparing our table and having someone over, that person you work with, that person that isn't a Christian, right? Inviting them over, bringing them into your world. Because as long as there is one person away from Christ in Brisbane, in our state, in our nation, man, there's still room. There's still room. 